Due to mature and graphic subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. You are about to become a witness. Captured on camera. Since they were first used in the mid-1980s, video cameras in cop cars have not only been used as a valuable training tool, but they've given us all a rare glimpse into the real world of police work. From unbelievable acts of violence to incredible acts of heroism. It's $137.50. Crazy. Oh, oh, From can't. everyday verbal abuse it's out, it's out. Down the to an officer's abuse of power. Black and blue marks across her body, her torso, upper torso, her legs, her arms. Get up now! Now, on the ground! On the ground! Virtually anything cops say and do can be caught on video. It's on the tape. There's no disputing that it happened. But even with this hard evidence, situations aren't always as they appear to be. MSNBC investigates. Cops caught on tape. Police departments across the country are adding video cameras into their arsenals. They provide visual evidence of traffic stops, even shootings. Sometimes they help catch bad cops in the act. But they also reveal just how dangerous even routine police work can be. We want to warn you, some of the videotape you're about to see may be disturbing. Carthage, Texas, 5.39 p.m. Officer Michelle Jeter pulls over a speeding van. What should have been a routine traffic stop turns into a life or death struggle. Police say Jeter finds marijuana in the van and tries to arrest Jorge Danel Orozco. But Orozco, already out on parole, does not want to go back to jail. Christina, get in the car. Go, baby, I can't go to jail. Orozco's eight-year-old daughter watches as her father beats Jeter, striking her in the face, knocking her to the ground, leaving her unconscious. By the time I turned around and come back, he had done done whatever he had going to do to her and was fading away. Are you okay? Are you okay? Help, officer, down. A passerby stays with Jeter. Another driver calls 911 Someone from his cell phone and follows a Rosco until police officers stop his van and arrest him. Officer Jeter is taken to a Shreveport hospital. Her injuries are serious. I have uh, four titanium plates in the left side of my face. Um, of course, it broke my nose. I have stitches inside my mouth and my left eye. Come on out, Southeast Loop. Hurry up. Michelle, can you tell me what happened? She doesn't remember the attack. But because of her patrol car camera, it is caught on tape. Get a supervisor out here ASAP. On February 17, 1998, Jorge Danell Orozco pleads guilty to the charge of aggravated assault of a police officer. He is now serving a 60-year sentence. Michelle Jeter now owns a car dealership in Carthage. She has left the force but remains a reserve officer. Another traffic stop, this time in Garrison, Texas. Another violent confrontation. Constable Daryl Lunsford decides to check the trunk for drugs. It will be the final act of his life. The suspects stab Constable Lunsford as they struggle for his 357 Magnum, then shoot him and run. They might have gotten away with murder, but a video camera in Lunsford's own patrol car videotapes his own death. 
When the case comes to trial, the video is condemning evidence that leads to the conviction of all three defendants. Not only that, but the Darrell Lunsford case and cases like it convinced police departments across the country to install video cameras in patrol cars. Jim Kaboviak is a Texas prosecutor who trains police on the use of mobile video systems. There's no one involved in the criminal justice process that does not believe in the videotaping, whether it be defense, prosecution, police officers, judges, because it gathers truth, and that's what court and the courtroom's all about. Today, a decade after Lunsford's death, hundreds of police forces use cruiser cam systems. They come at a cost, from $2,500 to $4,000 apiece. But more and more departments consider it money well spent. The uh, uh, value of the documentation that we get from these cameras as far as evidence and uh, the events that happen, is, uh, is you can't really put a price on it. All right. Hang tight. I think they'll find over a period of time that the man hours spent in court will decrease, the conviction rate will increase, and the system will well pay for itself within the first year. Cruiser cameras capture evidence for court and provide a video record of police actions, especially during traffic stops. And even when they record tragedies, they are a valuable tool. Today, police cadets across the country study these tragic videos to learn what went wrong. Mobile video has spawned a whole new training field where officers sit down and examine not only the tapes of their department, but neighboring departments and across the United States to learn from the mistakes of other officers. Nothing can bring back police officers whose lives are lost, but their legacy is the lives these videos have saved. When Texas State Trooper Andy Lopez is caught in a situation similar to Lunsford's fatal encounter, he's able to escape and shoots one assailant during the gunfight. You see something that could be a dangerous situation, an individual making some kind of movement that leads you to believe he's going for a weapon. You've got to do something. Lopez credits the lessons he learned from studying Lunsford's video with saving his life. I remember viewing that tape and telling myself that I wasn't going to let that happen to me. Having the cameras has been a valuable tool for us. It does give you that much more as far as documenting evidence. It's indisputable. It's on the tape. There's no disputing that it happened. When we come back, on a New Jersey interstate, police pursue a fleeing motorist. The chase ends with 11 seconds of terror. On a New Jersey interstate, police pursue a fleeing motorist. The chase ends with 11 seconds of terror. 25 bullets in all are fired at one unarmed man. What happened in the early morning hours of June 2nd, 1999, is caught by a video camera in one of the police cars. But as is sometimes the case, the video raises more questions than it answers. All that can be said for sure is that Stanton Crew, the man who led police on that chase, died that night. But why he died is far from clear. Stanton Crew was a 32-year-old account executive at a computer firm in Morristown, New Jersey. Stan was fun-loving. Um happy-go-lucky guy if he could help someone that he knew with something he would crew was working at home late that night when he received a phone call from a friend in a bar requesting a ride 
According to court documents, police say Crew was driving erratically. They say they thought he was drunk. Dover, New Jersey patrolman Barry Young later testified he signaled Crew to pull over. Crew ignored him and instead led police on a 15-minute chase on Interstate 80. It isn't until other police departments join the pursuit that it's captured on video. The camera is in a New Jersey state trooper's car. If all police cars had uh, video cameras, you know, all of Mr. Crew's uh, driving on that particular evening would have been recorded for all to see. Unfortunately, it was not. Boxed in by the police and a tractor trailer truck, crew makes a desperate U-turn across the grassy median of the interstate and heads in the opposite direction. After a 16-mile chase, crew finally pulls over onto a sloped, grassy shoulder. But he continues to move his car back and forth in what police say is an attempt to escape and run over one of them. Then all hell breaks loose. It is difficult to tell what really happened that night because the police who opened fire on crew are not visible on the videotape. In fact, the officer with his gun drawn in the center of the picture never fires a shot. John Whipple is the lawyer for Denville, New Jersey officer William Underwood, who did fire two of the bullets that hit Stanton crew. The precipitating officer fired first uh, in protection of himself as the vehicle was heading towards him. My client fired um, three shots um, to protect the life of the precipitating officer whose life he thought was in danger. In just 11 seconds, police fire 25 bullets. They just stepped out of the car and started firing. And they said he tried to back up and run over and move. You can't get out of the way. Why are you standing in back of the car with the person still in the driver's seat? You haven't asked him to step out or anything, so you're going to go and stand in back of the car and start firing. If deadly force is being used by Mr. Crew using his car in an attempt to run over a police officer, your training tells you to make that split-second decision to shoot at Mr. Crew to stop that threat. Get out of the car! Put your hands up! It is only after the shooting stops that we hear the police yell for Crew to get out of the car, but he has been hit by four rounds and dies at the scene. There were no verbal commands after boxing the car in. You can clearly see this on the tape. Um, there's no verbal direction to, to, to turn the car off or exit the vehicle, their hands up. There are they're, they're just a barrage of shots. Crew's family doesn't just question the shooting. They also question why the police wanted to stop him in the first place. There was an issue of him driving erratically. That was their initial statement for getting behind him in the first place. However, we don't know exactly how he was driving, and there's no visual depiction of it. In fact, a state autopsy shows Stanton Crew wasn't drunk, as the police suspected. He had no alcohol or illegal drugs in his system. But seven months after the shooting, a New Jersey grand jury finds insufficient evidence to charge the police officers with criminal wrongdoing or racial bias. A federal investigation also concludes that the officers did not violate Cruz's civil rights. Officer Underwood always maintained that he made a split-second decision uh, to use uh, deadly force to save the life of a Parsippany police officer. He always uh, felt terrible about having to do what he did. However, he always felt that he accomplished what he was trained to do. There are officers right up on him, shooting him. This is not, this is not a, a shootout. It's not an exchange of bullets. It's a shootout. For Crew's family and friends, many questions linger. Was Stanton Crew a victim of racial profiling? 
Did he ever pose a threat to the officers? And why did he flee in the first place? Stan was driving on a suspended license, um, and perhaps that was you know, his reasoning for not pulling over as soon as he should have. But I do ask myself the question of why didn't he stop, why didn't he pull over, and I can't answer that, I don't know. No matter how many times anyone looks at the tape, it does not tell the whole story of why the officers shot and killed Stanton Crew. You can clearly see that there was poor judgment exercised on both parts, but fatality was not the answer and there was 16 miles there was 16 miles to truly and clearly figure out an alternate means of apprehending a stand there truly was 27 shots does not apprehend it doesn't subdue it kills police declined to be interviewed for our original report since then crew's mother filed a federal lawsuit against the officers involved it was settled with 1.5 million dollars going to the estate of stanton crew when we come back. Cameras in the police cars were first used for drunk driving to allow the jury to see exactly what police officers saw on the side of the road when they made their arrest of an intoxicated person. Is there any way that we can show this request? A South Carolina trooper loses it when a woman fails to pull over quickly enough after he flashes his lights. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! I have my seatbelt on! He draws his gun and drags her out of the car. Get out now! Now, on the ground! On the ground! When department supervisors look at the videotape shot by a camera in the trooper's own car, the trooper is fired. I've been behind you for going on. But more often than not, cruiser cams work for the police, providing valuable evidence when they pull drivers over. Cameras in the police cars were first used for drunk driving to allow the jury to see exactly what police officers saw on the side of the road when they made their arrest of an intoxicated person. Mr. Corn, what? How much have you had a drink tonight? Nothing. 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 Okay. As motorists fail sobriety tests, that evidence can be dramatic convincing well, can you say the alphabet for me sir a b c f f g h y f x f and sometimes just plain embarrassing i believe you're too intoxicated to be driving i'm song. really not turn around i got this test okay Cruiser cams have also proven to be a lifesaver in defending the actions of police. These videos may look routine, but they certainly aren't to officers who are falsely accused. Now you have a suspended driver's license, and you told me that you didn't. I didn't think that I did. A police officer in Palm Beach, Florida, stops a female driver. Without ever getting out of the car, she is issued a traffic citation and heads off. But later, in a videotaped statement, she lodges serious charges against the officer. Please tell me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guys. Yeah. She accused him of taking her out of the car, frisking her, sexually assaulting her, and placing her back in the car. When I stepped out of the car, he proceeded to frisk me on the side, mm -hmm. pat, me on, pat me on my chest up here, mm -hmm. and then he fondled my breast. I believe it was fondling. I don't believe it was frisking. He patted me on my stomach all the way down and over my dress. Yeah. He caressed my vagina. I feel very, very, very violated. In a second taped interview, the police inform her that the entire traffic stop was shot on videotape and give her an opportunity to change her statement, but she declines. So what if I told you that I've seen the videotape of this incident in its entirety from the time that you were stopped to the time that you left the scene? Would that change any of your statements that you just told me? Yeah. They then accused her, of course, of lying 
and making a false report to this incident. Finally, she admits that she lied, that she fabricated the story. Why would you do something like this to somebody who didn't do anything to you except write your ticket? I'll explain why. I would have been driving a Jaguar if I had been driving a Mercedes or anything along those lines. I would have never been stopped. And I personally think he had a personal attack on me because of my character. Without the videotape, it might have been hard for the policeman to defend himself. It would have been the officer's word against her word. And that's exactly what mobile video was for. That's what cameras in the police car are for, is to gather the facts. Go for CM83, a traffic stop. Some police departments require officers to run cruiser cams through the entire shift. For others, officers activate cameras by either turning on the overhead lights from a remote switch on their belt or by pressing a button on the console. The time and date are visible on the image and the tapes can't be erased or recorded over. The recorders are in a locked box in the trunk that only a supervisor can open. In Chesterfield Township, Michigan, if the police didn't have video cameras in their patrol cars, two officers might have lost their jobs and reputations. The trouble starts the day after an arrest is made for illegal drugs at a traffic stop. The following morning, I received a phone call from the male and the female indicating that the officer had improperly touched her breast during the traffic stop and as a result caused injury to the female. The accused officer, Jason Davidovich, is caught off guard. My stomach just dropped because even though I didn't know I did nothing wrong, just having serious charges brought against you like that which you know could mean jail time, losing your job, losing everything you work for. It, it's, a, it's a really eerie feeling. It's like leaks you hollow inside. The accusing couple files a complaint, not knowing the arrest was caught by a patrol car video camera. It clearly showed that the officers acted properly. Uh, without those tapes, the officer may be uh, waiting trial himself for improperly touching a female. As a result, uh, we were able to file charges against the two people for filing a false police report. I could have lost my job, my house, everything I've worked so hard for. I mean, I put a lot of years into being a good police officer, and I could have lost it with just that one false police accusation against me. So it's scary to say the least. When we come back... I'm not going to pull any punch. I'm going to say we are embarrassed at the actions of our officers that were caught on video. Sit down! Sit down! Get on the ground! Sit down! Sit down! Videotape. In the past, some police officers viewed it as another tool for Big Brother to use against them. No longer. Now, more and more cops find the use of video cameras in their cars and station houses to be another effective form of backup. They have helped save millions in legal fees and have been invaluable in saving reputations. But for officers who cross the line or lose control, video can be a powerful force against them. The March 1991 beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles caught on home video. The July 2000 beating of Thomas Jones in Philadelphia captured by a news helicopter. Incidents like these have helped shape the public debate over police treatment of minorities. But they might have gone unnoticed if they weren't captured on tape. In April 1996, on this rural road in Riverside County, California, the U.S. Border Patrol spots a pickup truck loaded with what are believed to be illegal immigrants. The driver refuses to pull over, and the chase is on. Forty-five minutes later, the truck gets on the interstate, heading north at speeds averaging 90 miles per hour. Police say the occupants of the truck are now pelting them with beer cans and worse. On at least two different occasions, it came next to another car and purposely drove into that car, attempting to knock that vehicle off the road. The truck turns west onto the Pomona Freeway. 
the shabby camper top falls apart and reveals 19 people inside. 90 minutes after the chase begins, covering more than 80 miles, the pickup finally pulls over. The truck came to a stop at the Pomona Freeway and Peck Road in the, I believe, the city of El Monte when all of the occupants in the bed got out, ran down the shoulder of the freeway. What happens next is captured by news helicopters from three Los Angeles TV stations. One deputy, Tracy Watson, wields his baton like a baseball bat at two immigrants who offer no resistance. He clubs one man on the back and shoulders, even as he falls face down on the ground. When another passenger, Alicia Sotero Vasquez, climbs out of the window of the cab, Deputy Watson grabs her by the hair, beats her in the back with his baton, and pulls her to the ground. A second deputy, Kurt Franklin, joins in and strikes her with his baton. Black and blue marks across her body, her torso, upper torso, her legs, her arms, and her back had a number of, looked like very deep welt marks. Uh, it was our impression and the doctor's impression that she had been hit more severely on the back than in any other part of her body. And I'm not going to pull any punch. I'm going to say we are embarrassed at the actions of our officers that were caught on videotape. But the question remains, are the beatings a justified reaction by the deputies? The lawyer for Deputy Kurt Franklin says yes. When you consider, from looking at the tape, the strikes that Tracy Watson and Kurt Franklin did, Kurt's strikes were within departmental policy. They were where they were supposed to be. They did not number more than he needed to do in order to gain compliance. But lawyers for the immigrants say the video clearly shows they offered no resistance. We're talking about a five-foot woman who weighed about 95 pounds and a man who was maybe five and a half feet tall, five five, maybe weighed 150 pounds, had already been subdued. The officers who beat and apprehended these two persons not only acted excessively with great cruelty, but were totally unrestrained in what they had done. As a result of the beating and the videotape, the two deputies are suspended. But after an internal investigation, Franklin is reinstated, though Watson is fired. The victims file a $10 million lawsuit against Riverside County, California. But the case never gets to a jury. The two sides decide to settle, and each of the victims receives $370,000, all because the actions of two policemen were caught on tape. I think without this videotape, it would have been very, very difficult to convince a jury in Riverside County that these people were beaten unnecessarily or that excessive force was used. I think, I think it would have been very difficult. When we come back, a bridal shower turns ugly. A bridal shower turns ugly. More than 40 deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department respond. The deputies say they are attacked. The party goers insist it is the deputies who attack them. They rushed me with the batons, flashlights. I mean, they were hitting me with everything. It appears to be a case of the deputies' words against the civilians. But what neither side knows is that someone across the street is videotaping the incident. The party is a bridal shower for Melinda Dole. The music is a little too loud for a neighbor who calls the police. That's where the trouble starts. Marshal Team E. Edward, head of street in Norin, and Iran. Loud music and Two deputies pull up to the Dole's house, ask them to turn down the music, and leave. 
But 15 minutes later, Sergeant William Unlin is calling for backup. It's a large group of very large Samoans, and uh, I want to make sure we're going to take action before we go in 10 4. There's an MTT 292. A second caller advises they're still fighting with sticks and knives. When Sergeant Unland and his backup deputies return to the Dole's house, they say they are confronted by a number of people, including the bride's brother, David. They were yelling and screaming, waving their arms. Uh, uh, David was uh, standing in front of the gate, uh, taking a combative stance, challenging me to come in and make him leave the party. Unland says he ordered the party goers to disperse or be arrested. A few party goers leave, but according to the deputies, many more remain and show no signs of moving. Sergeant Unlin calls for all available deputies to respond and begins arresting the party goers. David Dole is the first, but Unlin says that as he reaches for Dole, he is hit with a barrage of rocks and bottles, scarring his helmet and knocking him unconscious. Deputies respond until the street is clogged with patrol cars and officers in riot gear. According to a court deposition, there is a police helicopter hovering overhead and no fewer than 54 squad cars, around 100 deputies, all to break up a party. As proof of the severity of the attack, a number of officers, including Sergeant Unlin, say they are bruised, cut, and scraped by everything from beer bottles to boulders. Four days later, charges of riot and assault are filed against dozens of partygoers. But the Doles insist all along it is the deputies who instigated the violence. I didn't cuss at anybody. I didn't hit anybody. I didn't throw anything. The whole time I was just being beaten that whole night. Dole says the beating left him with a broken hand and a deep head wound. He says he watched helplessly as his friends and relatives were assaulted, including his 62-year-old father, who suffers two broken ribs. According to the Doles, a neighbor's 17 minutes of shaky video show the truth of what happened that night. They treated us, our family, like animals that night. They didn't care if it was female or male. They just, everybody was beaten and... It was uh, terrible. The tape reveals several instances of deputies clubbing party goers who appear to be offering no resistance. Here, a man is rushed out of the house only to be collared by a club wielding deputy. Here, another man already on the ground is surrounded by officers pummeling him with batons. And as this deputy guards another party-goer on the ground, he lands a two-handed swing with his baton. The videotape is enough to convince a jury to acquit David Dole and two others of the felony charges they faced, and to convince the prosecutors to drop charges against 26 others. But the Doles want an apology and more. We all knew that we were right. We didn't do anything wrong. The Doles file a civil lawsuit, and now it is the deputies who are on trial. One after the other, dozens of deputies repeat the same story. The partygoers had started the riot, pelting them with a barrage that ended just before that videotape started rolling. Patricia Alberico, Kathleen Keating, Claude Bowen, and Daniel Hackney were four of the 12 jurors in the deputies' trial. When we retire to deliberate, Patricia says, I know how we can prove conclusively who's telling the truth. One of the officers in his testimonies said, well, not one of them, several of them, many of them, most of them, that rocks and bottles, rocks and bottles, rocks and bottles, fearing for their lives. And he called in to the dispatch. <laughs> Those radio transmissions were blaring out from squad car radios and picked up on that neighbor's videotape. The transmissions are coded with the exact time of day. The jurors realize they can match the time of the radio calls with the videotape. They discover that the video started rolling just a minute and a half after the frantic radio calls for help. 
The deputies say the rock and bottle barrage lasted as long as 20 minutes. But the jurors say they saw no evidence of that on the videotape. We're hearing over the police airwaves this officer yelling, screaming, saying they're being assaulted and they need backup because they're taking rocks and bottles and not a one. And the videotape goes on. And you don't see anyone. Not, a one. not And you don't a hear one. anything hitting the ground. And they would roll the videotape. And what you saw was this neatly manicured, freshly mowed front yard at Putting Greenland with no rocks or bottles in sight. In the end, the jurors don't believe the deputy's story that they were the ones who came under attack. They were flat out lying. The jury finds for the doles on all counts, imposing at the time the biggest police brutality verdict in history, nearly $16 million. And all because a neighbor heard a ruckus and turned on a home video camera. You can't beat the truth, and that's what prevailed in this case. None of the deputies involved has been disciplined. The official reason? No one could identify any of the deputies accused of brutality. After 10 years of delays, the Doles finally received their damage reward, which, with interest, had grown from nearly $16 million to $24 million. For their part, the deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department now shoot their own video whenever they have to break up what they believe is a disruptive party. When we come back, the fine's right here, sir. It's $137.50. You're crazy! Ah! As the use of video cameras in and out of police cars explodes, more and more cops are being caught on tape. It has opened a whole new window on what it's like to be a police officer. Whether they are doing something that is blatantly wrong or sometimes taking it on the chin. Most law enforcement officers are prepared for a physical altercation when they stop a motor vehicle. What they may not be prepared for is verbal abuse. Listen to this videotaped exchange between a main state trooper and a motorist pulled over for speeding. The fine's right here, sir. It's $137.50. You're crazy! Oh, oh, I can't! You're crazy! My wife took money out of her! Count where she's working to pay my insurance so I wouldn't get picked up. Well, you're crazy. If you don't pick this up, sir, I'm going to summon you for littering. I'll pick my a hundred. Are you crazy? I wasn't even speeding, you. The officer lets the driver go with just a speeding ticket. Jesus. There's some more right there. But the rule of the road, which is captured every day on videotape, is expect the unexpected. Whether it's being clipped by another motorist on the side of the road, or saving the life of a child after a horrific tornado. In May 1999, one of the most powerful tornadoes on record looms on the Oklahoma landscape. This is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. The killer storm bears down on tiny Bridge Creek, 40 miles outside of Oklahoma City. Get into a storm shelter if you have one. Get into an enclosed closet. In their house, dead center in the storm's path, is Amy Crago, her 10-month-old daughter, Aaliyah and the rest of her family crammed into a closet, terrified and expecting the worst. And we heard the tornado coming. It just started ripping the house apart. I thought I was going to die. And, and it just hurt so bad. 
and you can just can't imagine how bad it hurts to be in the middle of a tornado. And you're just flying through the air like you don't weigh nothing. And then in a matter of seconds, it's over. And I had this cut on my head and I'd bled all over me and mud all over me. And I was looking and looking. Unable to find her child or her family, Amy wanders through the rubble searching for help. A passing motorist takes her to the hospital. Deputy Sheriff Robert Jolly, searching for survivors, drives to where Amy's house had been. Hoping, but not expecting to find anyone alive, Jolly spots what he thinks is a doll. But as he picks it up, baby Aaliyah starts to cry. These extraordinary and tender moments are captured by Jolly's cruiser cam. You okay? Basically, all she wanted was to be held. She didn't seem to be hurt in any way. Little Aaliyah is bruised, but okay, thanks to an act of bravery caught on tape. In Chesterfield Township, Michigan, Peter DeBlock needs a miracle, too. He stops his car as he begins to pass out from a diabetic reaction. His last waking thought is shock as his van bursts into flames. When patrolman Brian Dowell arrives at the scene, the van is burning up. As I got out of my car, I could hear somebody yell, the driver was still inside. When I woke up again, the fire was really, really raging. The flames and smoke are so thick, patrolman Dowell is unable to see into the van. I reached the driver's door and seen the fingers of Mr. DeBlock reaching out and yelling, I'm burning, I'm burning. I uh, tried to get my seatbelt undone and I couldn't get the seatbelt, it, it had melted, so I couldn't do the latch. Dowell tries to pull DeBlock out, but he can't. Another officer hands Dowell a knife. I cut the seatbelt and we pulled Mr. DeBlock out of the vehicle, falling to the ground. I was just happy to be out of there, and if it wasn't for that officer, I wouldn't be here. It was like I was taking my last breath, and out I came. No matter how many times videotape shows how dangerous and challenging it is to be a police officer, there is no shaking the graphic images of police brutality they can reveal. At times, videotape may not tell the whole truth, but it allows us to put ourselves in the shoes of the officers who make split-second, right or wrong, life and death decisions and make them every day. The Bureau of Statistics at the Justice Department estimated in a 2003 survey that 55% of local police departments use video cameras in their patrol cars. That number was just 10% four years before. And there's a move to replace problem-prone VHS systems with high-quality digital cameras. Some wireless systems even allow officers to download photos directly to their precincts. That's our report. Thanks for watching. I'm John Siegenthaler.